The Supreme Court's decision in Scott versus Harris arose out of a high-speed vehicle pursuit that could probably rival a car chase filmed in Hollywood. The case began rather innocently. Victor Harris was speeding one night. An officer activated his lights, signaling him to stop, but Mr. Harris fled. He raced down narrow two-lane roads. It was night. Speeds were in excess of 85 miles per hour. He swerved around more than a dozen cars, crossed the double yellow line, and forced other cars off the road to avoid being hit. Harris ran multiple red lights and traveled for considerable periods of time in the occasional center lane. He did all that while being chased by numerous police cars. Harris even rammed one of the police cruisers during the chase. Enter Officer Timothy Scott. Officer Scott pushed Victor Harris off the road by ramming the rear bumper of Harris' vehicle with the push bumper on Scott's cruiser. And at the speeds both men were traveling, almost 100 miles per hour, Harris lost control and crashed. He was severely injured. Harris sued Officer Scott for violating his right to be free from an unreasonable seizure under the Fourth Amendment. Harris claimed that pushing him off the road at the speed he was traveling amounted to deadly force and that it was excessive under the circumstances. Officer Scott, in turn, asked the lower court to dismiss Harris' case on grounds of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity is a police officer's defense to standing trial in a civil case for a constitutional tort. The rationale is that, that officers should be permitted to perform their duties without fear of constantly having to defend themselves against unsubstantiated claims for damages. To keep the case alive after an officer requests qualified immunity and proceed to trial, the plaintiff, Harris, must show that the officer violated a clearly established constitutional right. That usually means adopting, as the lower court did here, the plaintiff's version of what happened. Accepting the plaintiff's version of what happened generally makes sense if we stop to think that granting the officer qualified immunity literally denies a plaintiff like Victor Harris his day in court. There will be no trial. Granting the officer qualified immunity is essentially telling the plaintiff, even accepting your version of what happened, no jury could find for you. On the other hand, the judge should deny the officer qualified immunity if the judge finds a material dispute about the facts. In that case, the judge should send the case to the trial to settle the dispute or decide, you know, who's telling the truth here? Not surprisingly, Mr. Harris painted an entirely different picture about what happened than Officer Scott. Indeed, you know, one might get the impression from Mr. Harris' version of the facts that instead of fleeing from police, Mr. Harris was attempting to pass his driving test when Officer Scott so violently pushed him off the road. Following the general rule, accepting Harris' version of the events made the lower court deny Officer Tim Scott qualified immunity. The lower court essentially told Officer Scott that there would have to be a trial to determine who was telling the truth. The Supreme Court granted certiorari. The Supreme Court reversed the lower court. In doing so, the court decided two issues, both in favor of Officer Scott. The first issue focused on the general rule that required a court to accept the plaintiff's version of what happened in a qualified immunity analysis. The wrinkle in that rule, so to speak, was the dash camera video on the police cruiser. The dash cam video very clearly contradicted Mr. Harris's version of what happened that night. On the video, we see Mr. Harris racing down narrow two-lane roads in the dead of night at speeds that are shockingly fast. We see it swerve around more than a dozen other cars, cross double yellow lines, force cars traveling both directions to their perspective shoulders to avoid being hit. We see Harris's car run multiple red lights. We see it travel for considerable periods of time in the occasional center lane, all the time while being chased by numerous police cars. Far from being the cautious driver Harris tried to depict himself as, the video more closely resembles a Hollywood-style chase of most frightening sort, placing officers and innocent bystanders at great risk. The Supreme Court noted a caveat in the rule to deny the officer qualified immunity, there must be a genuine dispute about the facts. The court held that no reasonable jury could believe Mr. Harris's side of the story or find it genuine after seeing the video. There were no allegations that this videotape was doctored or altered in any way, nor any contention that 
what it depicts differed from what actually happened. The court rejected Harris's version of what happened. It accepted the video as what happened. And that left the final issue, whether pushing Victor Harris off the road violated the Fourth Amendment under the facts in this video. Officer Scott did not contest that his decision to terminate the car chase by ramming his bumper into Harris's vehicle triggered the Fourth Amendment. A Fourth Amendment seizure occurs when there is a governmental termination of movement through means intentionally applied, and that most assuredly happened here. The issue was whether the seizure was objectively reasonable. Harris made a last-ditch effort to win the case, or at least keep it alive. He urged the Supreme Court to analyze this case as it analyzed Tennessee versus Garner. His argument went like this. Garner's, the Garner decision concerned deadly force to stop a fleeing suspect. And deadly force, according to Garner, he thought, was not reasonable to stop a suspect's flight, not unless the officer had probable cause to believe that the suspect had committed a crime involving the infliction or threatened infliction of serious bodily harm, that the force was necessary to stop the suspect, and not unless the officer gave some sort of warning, you know, if feasible. Before using deadly force to stop a suspect's flight, Harris believed the officer needed probable cause that the suspect, like himself, had committed a crime involving the infliction or threatened infliction of serious bodily harm. Like a fleeing Osama bin Laden or an armed robber attempting to run away. In short, Harris, Harris believed that deadly force could not be used to stop a suspect's flight unless the suspect somehow posed a significant threat to society if left at large. Harris then turned his, to his case. Deadly force, he believed, was used to stop his flight. He pointed to the fact that Officer Scott pushed him off the road while traveling upwards of, of 100 miles per hour. Serious injury, if not death, was likely. What's more, he believed that the force was unreasonable because he was not someone who posed that significant threat to society if left at large. Again, he was not a terrorist or armed robber. If allowed to escape, he would simply go home get up in the morning and go back to work. The Supreme Court obviously rejected Harris's argument, and for a number of reasons. First, Garner did not establish a magical on-off switch that triggers rigid preconditions for using deadly force. Garner was simply an application of the objective, objective reasonableness test. Garner simply held that it was not objectively reasonable to shoot a fleeing, unarmed burglary suspect in the back of the head. When the officer could not reasonably believe that he posed any threat, and the officer never attempted to justify his actions on any basis other than the need to prevent escape. By way of example only, the Garner court hypothesized that it may be reasonable to shoot a fleeing suspect that poses a continuing threat to society if allowed to remain at large. But the facts in Garner had scant application to what happened in this case. This was not a mere foot chase, as occurred in Garner. This flight was by means of a speeding vehicle that posed a real, very real threat of serious bodily harm to others on the road. We might say that every use of force case requires us to go back to the Supreme Court's decision in Graham versus Connor, the heart of which is to weigh the nature of the intrusion on the suspect's liberty against the countervailing governmental interests at stake. In other words, every case requires us to ask what the officer did to the suspect, or what was the nature of the intrusion on the suspect's liberty, and then why the officer did it, or what was the governmental interest at stake. No doubt, what Officer Scott did, pushing Victor Harris off the road at the speeds both men were traveling, was likely to cause serious injuries. But why did Officer Scott do that? What was the governmental interest at stake? Because Harris's flight by means of a speeding vehicle posed a significant threat to others, you know, we can see why that, why that force was reasonable. We must always go back to Graham. We weigh the nature of the intrusion on the suspect's liberty against the countervailing governmental interest at stake. What was the nature of the intrusion on Harris's liberty? Another error is to assume that there is a precise definition of what deadly force is. Shooting a suspect in the back of the head, as occurred in Tennessee versus Garner, is certainly deadly. You know, but pushing Harris off the road, not so much. Forced to choose between the two, most would choose being in the car. Certainly, Officer Scott's actions pose a high likelihood of serious injury, though not the near certainty of death posed by death, posed by shooting somebody in the back of the head, or say, 
pulling alongside a fleeing motorist's car and, and shooting him. So how did the Supreme Court go about weighing the perhaps lesser probability that Harris might injure bystanders against the larger probability of injuring just Harris? The court thought it appropriate to take into account their relative culpability. It was Harris, after all, who intentionally placed himself at risk. But wait, stated Harris, couldn't the innocent public have been protected and the, the tragedy he suffered been avoided if the police simply ceased their pursuit? The court believed that there was no way to be sure that stopping the pursuit would have, would have caused Harris to stop his dangerous flight. Going back to Graham, that would be judging the officers by hindsight. No doubt, high-speed vehicle pursuits pose a serious threat to everyone on the road. And for that reason, state law and agency policy often impose heightened requirements on when officers can engage in them. Violate policy and officers can face administrative sanctions. Violate state law, they may even be prosecuted. But if the officer is sued for excessive force under the Fourth Amendment, the court will apply the objective reasonless test in Graham versus Connor. The court's decision in Scott versus Harris establishes the relationship between Graham and Garner. Garner establishes examples as to when deadly force, shooting a suspect, is objectively reasonable. That said, there are no hard and fast rules as to what deadly force is or when it can be used. As the court stated in Scott versus Harris, we must slosh our way through the fact-bound morass of reasonless every time. My name is Tim Miller and this has been Fletzy Talks.